Superman, 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 Superman. I'm Joey Tedesco, and welcome to this special retrospective on the Paramount Superman cartoons. Now, I was gonna do a cartoon pulls a shardy of one short, but screw it. All these shorts are consistent in quality, story, and the characters. I figure that I may as well review all of them. It also comes to no surprise that I'm having this video come up with the upcoming and controversial release of Man of Steel. Controversial in the sense that previews and trailers have left fans divided on how Zack's slow-mo speeded up Snyder will interpret the well-known story. Well, if I had to be completely honest with you, I may as well just tell you how I feel about these shorts. I love them. They're the ideal image of Superman. Though, then just saying that, I may as well go through and explain why. The first Superman short was conceived when Paramount wanted the Betty Boop creators Max and Dave Fleischer to make new cartoons. Paramount's response was to give the Fleischers enough money, and by enough I mean compare and contrast how much Disney was paying their animators to make a cartoon, and the result was an adaptation of the popular Kryptonian created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. I mean popular in that the character was made aware outside of the comic books with newspaper strips and a radio show. At this point, it was Superman's first appearance on screen, combining the visual appeal with the written. Much like Popeye, the first eight shorts were produced by the Fleischs, with the last produced by the famous studios. In my opinion, these shorts represent the Fleischs' last great hoorah before fading away, leaving behind a legacy of experimentation, wacky visuals, gags, and sensual appeal. Above all else, their best work reflects adult themes and attitudes, and these shorts are a prime example, going from bright colors to kicking ass. Bullets, explosions, and taking names. Oh, come on. Michael Bay wishes he can make movies like this. The shorts themselves are rather straightforward. It begins with a traditional exposition of what Superman can do and his alter ego, Clark Kent. Superman has assumed the skies of Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. Yeah, the 1940s cartoons have given us a slew of masters of disguises. For a minute, I thought that rabbit was a cross-dressing dude. This leads to a bunch of stories that, well, for the most part can get pretty redundant. Something mysterious goes on, Lois reports about it, she gets in trouble, Superman drops by to save the day, the story is published, and no one is the wiser. While the plot can feel recycled at times, the real crux of the films are the action. Superman is usually pitted against robots, mad doctors, monsters, and such that it works really well. I especially love how there's a sense of struggle. I'm not sure if this came out before Kryptonite was made as Superman's weakness, but there's a real sense of struggle and weight that's pushing against him when he fights that makes the threat seem plausible. You know, for a cartoon made decades ago. I'm not sure if this comic plays close to the source material or if the Fleischers have had creative freedom, but it does play close to the universal elements we associate to Superman and his powers. Well, almost all of them. I'm almost certain that Superman doesn't shoot lasers out of his eyes, but it's more of a modern power otherwise. Hell, it was the shorts where we see Superman fly for the first time. At that point, it was just him leaping to great bounds like the Hulk. Heck, even when famous studios came in, they decided to change the plot around a little. They focus less on science fiction and feature more mobsters modeled like Orson Welles for some reason, and Nazis. Kind of a refreshing change from saving Lois Lane all the time. As strange as this might sound, adapting comics to cartoons back in the day was not an uncommon practice. If anything, it was encouraged because it makes it easier for animators to have characters that are already established and recognized by others. So yeah, that whole notion that Hollywood's been running out of ideas has actually started when Hollywood began. Go figure. Lois Lane is pretty much the Lois Lane we all know, and it's not that deep, complex character we've all come to expect. She gets into trouble and is kidnapped in almost every short. However, I don't feel that she was completely useless. The thing is, is that Lois has some personality. She's aggressive. She wants to be a good reporter, taking risks even if it costs her life. Sometimes there are things where she's clearly doing something stupid, but there are times where she manages to have some cojones. Do I find it frustrating that she can't just go pepper pots and save Superman for the change? Kind of. But these are things I have changed over with time. Progressive females in action films that are not damsels in distresses, it seems like we'll be seeing a Lois Lane that can fend for herself while having the no-nonsense attitude we've come to expect. Part of this also comes from the voice acting. My fellow reviewer's unknown co-reviewer and Twitter buddy, SWTronics, couldn't resist on commenting on the facets of these shorts. 
The voice acting was well done for Superman and Lois. They should come as no surprise since Bud Collier, the standard by which all Superman voice actors will be judged, continued on from his day in the radio drama, as did Joan Alexander for Lone Lane, but really demonstrates the most important part of playing the character, treating Clark Kent and Superman as separate characters in mannerisms and in voice. Yeah, he doesn't speak like this, but uh, every time I'm reading for someone, I have to put in a British accent somehow. Now, he does bring up a good point, since the Superman he portrays has this distinction between Clark Kent and his alter ego. That is, if he exclude the fact that in some cases he changes in broad daylight where anybody can catch him. Seriously? Juanita didn't happen to be getting a broom from the closet at the time? No, me, Mr. Superman, he, he knows he's here. Also, and this is just a nitpick, how exactly does he see when he looks like he's constantly squinting? I can only assume that this was a creative choice since it does resemble the way the comics drew the character. But I'm seriously considering the great power comes to the cost of your eyesight. It's no joke that his secret identity was him wearing glasses, because without them, he's blind as a bat. Would that make him? Nah. So yeah, for all my cracks on this series, there are qualities other than the animation and characters that makes this series worth owning. They're the most crucial element in my book, and that's the music. Sure, when you hear Superman's themes, we all go with the John Williams theme, which in itself is great and, well, no pun intended, uplifting. Then there's the theme from the animated series that pretty much does the same thing. But if there's one theme that makes me stand up, salute all glory, while marching up and down the street, it's the theme music. I'll have what she's having. I love this theme. Not only does it establish the other themes to follow by giving those three repetitive notes that sound like someone chanting Superman over and over again. I always imagine an aerial dogfight breaking the sound barrier with the American flag waving in the back. America, America! It's that theme music all Superman themes look up to, and it's my personal favorite. So let's just say Hans Zimmer's got some work to do. So back to the upcoming movie. This brand new adaption that takes a story might be taking elements from these shorts. Outside of the action resembling the fast pace and heavy weightlifting nature of these shorts, I do feel that the costume seems to share similarities, specifically the chest. I noticed some people complain that the yellow is dim and changes color, almost appearing like a metallic black. For me, this is actually pretty cool. Mind you, Superman's S didn't have yellow in these shorts. It was also in black. I think the only other time we've seen Superman wear an S with black in the back was the comic Kingdom Come. But the one defining thing that really gets me pumped is the actual font. Yes, I am that dorky that I will be commenting on the font of the logo. It has more of a 1930s look to it, and yet again, harks back to the Paramount cartoons. So yeah, I can work with these changes since they're not incredibly unfamiliar to me. Now I know I'm possibly overanalyzing at this point since the movie hasn't come out yet, and there's no official confirmation if Snyder took close influence from these cartoons. If there is, let me know. However, if we know he's worked in animation and treats the movies like live-action cartoons, even when some of those films can leave you banging on the ground like a caveman in anger, but I digress. To me, this would be great to see a Superman that's treated like his cartoon counterpart. Superman's not a real character. He's an ideal metaphor of what we strive to be. The man of tomorrow, the American dream, doing what we aspire to do. And that means doing the impossible, then by God bring it on. However, if that's not the case with Man of Steel, at least we have the Paramount cartoons that brought us this vision decades ago. Right now you can get it on DVD, however, you can actually find them for free on YouTube on WB's official channel. So, I recommend checking them out there. They're the ideal image of Superman. It's worth it. Now I'm Joey Tedesco, and thanks for watching this episode of Cartoon Palooza. Let's be honest, folks, this logo sucks.